Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. With nations across the world struggling to contain the coronavirus pandemic, there has never been a greater need for an internationally coordinated response. And that is where the UN agency, the World Health Organization, should come in. But right now, the WHO is itself at the center of a political storm. President Donald Trump has withdrawn American funding, accusing the WHO of being China-centric. Well, my guest today is the WHO special envoy for COVID-19, Dr. David Nabarro. Is his agency failing its biggest test? David Nabarro in Geneva, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Let us start with an overview. As a veteran of fighting disease from malaria to cholera to Ebola, you've now become the WHO Special Envoy on COVID-19. Are you more worried today than you were a month ago about the way it is spreading around the world? I was always anxious about this ever since I first heard about it. And I've got increasingly anxious as the uh, pandemic has gone on. You see, we're beginning to get some sense that the uh, outbreak can be controlled uh, in Europe and in the US. But that's as a result of very rigorous physical distancing through lockdown. My concern is that the virus hasn't gone away during these lockdowns and that as the lockdowns are released, if we're not fully defended, that the outbreaks will build up again. And I'm really worried about what's happening in poor countries on two accounts. One is that they have really very weak health services compared with uh, advanced countries. And secondly, that the lockdowns that have had to be introduced in so many countries now are also having impacts on people's food security, people's nutrition and their increasing poverty. David, do you regard it as inevitable, as some have said, that ultimately this pandemic will sweep through the most vulnerable countries of all? I'm thinking perhaps of Yemen, of the situation in northern Syria, of, of pretty broken countries like Venezuela. Will they all ultimately be hit hard by this pandemic? It certainly will be a threat to every country and every population in the world. So the only way we're going to be able to get on top of it and get ahead of it is, every, is if, if every society everywhere is knowing about it and is able to interrupt transmission for themselves. You, the really important point is to stress that it's not going to suddenly go away. It's going to stay with us for the foreseeable future. So this capacity to defend against it and to learn how to live with the constant threat of the virus is going to be the key for the future of humanity. In that context, how disappointing is it to you that the World Health Organization right now, far from being the sort of spearhead of a global attempt to control the virus, right now the World Health Organization is riven with political division. You have the United States withdrawing funding, you have other politicians criticizing you, and you have, let's face it, a profound credibility problem. Well, first of all, I want to stress that the way in which this virus is being tackled is through the most extraordinary network of public health experts throughout the world. Now, the public health community sees the World Health Organization as its focal point. We've all worked as either members of the World Health Organization or as parts of networks of the World Health Organization and for the public health community, there's absolutely no question. The World Health Organization is our lead organization. We don't have a problem with its credibility. If there are political leaders who have problems with the World Health Organization, that's for them to sort out. Remember, the WHO is governed by 194 member states, as they're called, and the WHO personnel operate under that governance structure. That, that, that is the bureaucratic sort of process behind the WHO. I just want to get down to brass tacks. There is a strong feeling in some quarters that the WHO colluded 
in a cover-up of the beginnings of the outbreak of COVID-19 in China. Is that the case? Oh, absolutely not. I would like to say it a second time. Absolutely if you, if not. You, if you are so sure, explain to me why we now have evidence that the Chinese authorities covered up for weeks knowledge that they had that this was an extremely dangerous new virus that was being transferred from human to human and the World Health Organization failed for week upon week to flag that up. Well, I, I mean, of course, what we will do in the World Health Organization as always happens, is a very detailed and forensic examination of exactly what happened on what days, who knew what, who told who what, and that will be the right thing to do. When I was working on Ebola in 2014, there were many accusations against different organisations of failure to act on time, and necessary investigations were done, and they, but they were done after we'd got on top of the outbreak. What matters now, and I want to stress this, Stephen, is that everybody everywhere focuses on the job that has to be done. We have a massive global emergency, and it's absolutely essential that we all focus on that. For us to be distracted and asked to do an inquiry right in the middle of everybody working flat out to try to keep people together to do what's necessary to do with this virus is frankly inappropriate. I understand that, and it is a very important point you make, but nonetheless, it isn't just about investigations of the past. It is about ongoing credibility, because we all need to know that the WHO, when it works with national governments, is able to access all of the data that governments are being transparent, are being honest about what is happening in their territory, and that therefore the WHO is a network which is sharing genuine information. And right now we can't be sure of that. We've just learned the official figures from Wuhan for the numbers uh, killed by COVID-19 were off by 50%. What else don't we know about the way this virus is working? Stephen, that is a super complex question to answer. I hope you will give me the time to answer it, and perhaps I have to ask you to repeat parts of it. Let's deal with the figures. I'd like you just to check what's been happening in the UK in the recent past. We were told, I believe over the last 24 hours, that the UK death estimates have had to increase because they found that they hadn't got all the deaths that were probably COVID related in their figures because they were dealing with them primarily on the basis of NHS results. And then they found there were additional deaths from people in residential institutions. The same for other countries as well. Revi revision of death numbers during an outbreak is very common. And viewers should not believe that just because death numbers have been revised, that means there's concealment. Secondly, the World Health Organization is not a global international health inspectorate. It's a brilliant organization that works in the way that it was set up to deal with information that is provided to it by individual members. It cannot compel governments to release information. It doesn't have the power. And that's the way in which we've always worked. And that, I presume, is the way we're going to continue to work unless governments give us different rules to work by. I understand that point, and it is an important one, but let us not forget that your boss, uh, Teb uh, Dr. Tedros, the head of the WHO, went to Beijing, and in the course of his conversations with Xi Jinping and others, he heaped praise upon the Chinese response to COVID-19. Now, Just knowing what you, we know, can do I you deeply you regret point? that? Can I interrupt you at this point? It is really important that your viewers understand exactly what Dr. Tedros was doing. He was praising the way in which the Chinese government responded to the outbreak when they realized what was going on. They did the number of things that every other country should be doing. They informed their people what was happening. They reinforced public health services. They repurposed hospitals and they got the whole of government to focus on the need to stop movement out of Wuhan, to stop the disease spreading elsewhere in the country. 
That was praised because it was the right thing to do. Other countries have done the same, particularly countries that were affected by SARS in 2003. That was what Dr. Tedros was praising and he has encouraged other countries to read the report of what we've seen was happening in China during February and to apply those findings themselves. That was correct. As my view, as a public health professional, that was the right thing to do. What do you say then to people, and I'm, we'll talk about Donald Trump in a minute, but people who actually have a lot of time for the WHO, who have even worked alongside it, people like David Fidler, fellow in global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, been a consultant to the WHO, who says, we have had a situation since the beginning of the year where it looks like the WHO doesn't want to exercise its authority when it came to its interventions with China. What do you say to that? Well, of course, the inquiries will be done. Those of us who are working on this right now believe that the World Health Organization has acted within the authorities that it has. And I'm going to continue to say that, even if you push me to try not to say it. I also want to stress the following. The World Health Organization has been very clear since the middle of January that there was a sense that this was a major and serious disease. On the 14th of January, that, that concern was expressed in press briefings and other communications, and it's been the same ever since. Take this virus seriously. Act quickly when you've got cases within your country. Do not, do not behave as though it's a mild disease. Do not treat it like it's flu. And that advice has been the drumbeat that's come from WHO since January. Understood. And we'll get to your advice to governments and people around the world in just a moment. But just one more point. Taiwan, the government of Taiwan says that it sent information to you at the WHO in late December describing their fear that human to human transmission of COVID-19, we didn't call it that then, but what is, we now know as COVID-19, was already happening. They say they got no response from you and there are many people concerned that because of your clo WHO's close relationship with the Chinese government, that anything that came from Taiwan was not taken seriously. Is that true? Well, that's not true. So let me just give you the facts as I understand them. And I want to stress, I was not working for WHO at the time. I started working as a special envoy uh, initially at the end of January. Now, on the 31st of December, China reported that it found a cluster of pneumonia-like illness in Wuhan, in Hubei province. And that report went to the WHO. On the same day, authorities in, in uh, Taiwan uh, wrote to WHO saying, we've heard that there is an outbreak of atypical pneumonia in Wuhan. Can you tell us anything about it? Uh, the, the WHO, as far as I understand, was not given any information from Taiwan that was different from what they received from the government of China. So uh, it will, of course, be an investigation, and I'm sure there will be more to be found, but that is the information that I have. And so it doesn't indicate that WHO was given information by Taiwan well, that it did not have you from know, China. You know as well as I do, Dr. Nabarro, that Donald Trump, for one, doesn't buy that. But let's look at the bigger picture of the relationship with the United States. Donald Trump tweeted out the WHO blew it. For some reason, they're funded mostly by the US, and yet they are, he says, very China-centric. He's pulled the 400 million or so dollars that the US puts into WHO funds every year. You have clearly a fundamental problem now with the United States. As a veteran fighter of global disease, how do you respond to what Donald Trump has done? You know, I've worked in global health really for more than 40 years, and I've worked in the international system with WHO and other organizations for more than 17 years. The most significant supporter in terms of personnel, in terms of partnership and funding is the United States of America. We've always had an absolutely superb relationship with the US and we continue to have that relationship. US experts participated in the mission to China. US experts are embedded in WHO's emergency response program. US experts have been 
constantly working with WHO, even recently, uh, the, uh, particularly those who are responsible for the control of communicable diseases. It's not true to say that WHO is anything other than very close to the United States of America, the, okay. as it should be, because it has so many superb experts on whom we and the world depend. But you have to recognise reality. Donald Trump has declared that he doesn't believe in the credibility of your organisation today. Gordon Brown described Trump's move as self-harm, an act of sabotage, he said many would see it as. Do you see it in that way? I really do not want to use any words to criticise any president of any country that is part of the international system. The way in which the international system works is by consent and by cooperation. When you've got a giant emergency like we have at the moment, the most important requirement is that all leaders work together to make sure that the well-being of 7.8 billion people is maximised. If one head of state decides that he wants to move away from that global consensus, that's not a problem just for the World Health Organization, it's a problem for the world. And it's a particularly serious problem if it is the leader of the organization that provides the majority of funding to our system. Let, let us look forward then, if we may. Uh, Dr. Tedros, your boss, said that the message to the world, all governments, had to be test, test, test. The truth is some governments, and I'm thinking of South Korea and Germany, have conducted mass testing, which appears to have been very important to putting a lid on the curve of infections. They've had success. Other countries, including the United Kingdom, have not tested in the same way, and their curve has not yet come down in the same way. Are you ready to call out countries like the UK for a fundamental failure? The World Health Organization is not in, in able to call out countries and criticize them. It's not how it works. What the World Health Organization does is it identifies approaches that look as though they're being successful. Well, the approach that is most useful in dealing with this disease is to interrupt transmission. It's easiest to interrupt transmission if you're able to test people to see if they have the virus. Many countries have made valiant efforts to upgrade their capacity to test it's a tricky test to do, and those countries that have done so and, and distributed testing widely have been able to get on top of the disease. The I'm interested. The challenge is poorer countries who are not able to rapidly upgrade testing, and for them we're doing everything possible to help them get access to tests, and also if they can't get access to tests, to explain to them how best to interrupt the transmission on the basis of what we call symptom-based diagnosis. I'm interested in your contention that it is absolutely not the WHO's role or responsibility to call nations out, but I've got two quick questions for you, brief answers if you would. When we see uh, China, it seems still happy to tolerate the so-called wet markets in cities like Wuhan, where live wild animals are sold in marketplaces alongside other foodstuffs. And we believe that may well be the way in which COVID-19 transferred to the human population. Isn't it time for you and others at the top of the WHO to say this is not acceptable it must stop. We can't say it's not acceptable, it must stop, but we can say that all the evidence suggests that wet markets and the eating of bush meat and similar practices are con contributing to an increased risk of zoonotic disease and we really discourage that Then practice. we need to redesign the WHO, don't we? To give it more teeth, to give it real power. Otherwise, what's the point? Stephen, you might want to redesign the WHO. I might want to redesign the WHO. But the WHO is governed by the world's nations and they meet together regularly and they work out how the mandates they want to give to the organization. They will no doubt review what's happened as a result of this and decide whether they want to change the mandate. But at the moment, the WHO has been given the powers to advise and to provide guidance and to review, but it does not instruct. Will there be uh, an easy exit from this. I'm guessing your answer is no, but I'm also guessing that actually you, in the course of this interview, have suggested that we have to 
think of this not in terms of weeks and months, but maybe even years before a semblance of normality is restored to our global cultures and societies. Is it like that? There are countries that are showing us that there are ways to continue with social and economic activity despite the fact that the virus is a continuing threat. We build on the experiences of those countries to establish guidance for the world and that suggests that we can transition out of the present situation living with Covid provided that we set up defences in communities everywhere and provided that we have clear protocols for how we're going to react if there are outbreaks. There is a way forward. If I yes. may, th this gets down to specifics. One small point I'm confused about. You, uh, in a previous interview, suggested you thought people around the world would have to get used to we wearing face masks. Now, that was your opinion, but then the WHO official opinion is still that the general public shouldn't wear face masks. Only healthcare and other care workers need to wear protective face masks. So, w what is the advice? The WHO position is clear. There's a world shortage of the high quality masks that protect everybody properly against getting infected by this disease. These are the N95 or FFP masks that filter out small particles. We want to make certain that these masks are kept aside preferentially for health workers to keep them safe. And we would like to make certain that health workers in poor countries are first in line for these masks and that they're not sequestered by people who are worried about their own safety. Secondly, people who've got the disease ought to be able to wear face coverings to reduce their risk. Thirdly, people whose occupations require them to be close to others and they can't avoid it also ought to be wearing face coverings. Fourthly, and the WHO has been clear on this, if the wider community is to start interacting and, and not being able to be f f uh, physically distancing all the time, then they should wear face coverings. There's a bit right. of a difference, I'm afraid, between the very sophisticated masks that are expensive and face coverings that we can I, make I for understand. ourselves. They're not quite so effective. But I believe, and I think the WHO is increasingly of the opinion, that br broader face coverings are going to be necessary as part of the collective strategy to deal oh, with this. Right. But we don't want health workers to be without protection. And that's Thank a key you. point. Uh, to be realistic, you're suggesting that as the United States, Europe, and we see it already, start trying to find ways to selectively ease the so-called lockdown, you appear to be suggesting that COVID-19 hasn't gone away and that there will be second, third, fourth, maybe multiple waves of yes. infection. For how long will those waves last? So this virus, we think, is not going to go away, period. So that means that we have to have one of two things. Either we have to have a situation where there's a treatment so that everybody who has the disease can take that treatment and then not be ill and not be at risk of death, or there has to be some kind of vaccine that enables everybody to be immunised and to be defended against the, the virus, as has happened for other virus diseases. It's just we don't have a vaccine and we don't know how long it's going to take to develop one and we don't yet have a treatment and we again don't know how long it's going to take for that to come along. So we've all got to learn to live with this virus, to do our business with this virus in our presence, to have social relations with this virus in our presence and not to be continuously having to be in lockdown because of the widespread uh, infections that can occur. David Nabarro, I thank you very much indeed for joining me from Geneva. Thank you very much.